Okay, so I'm just gonna ask you to introduce yourself before we get started. Yeah, I'm Alex Julius and I work for the Davy Tree Expert Company. Okay. The Employee Development and Safety Training Specialist. Okay, so what does that mean? What do you do? What does that mean? That is a great question. <laughs> um, so I'm in a unique position of, we've got an 11,000 person company. Okay, that's big. That's a lot of people <laughs> to try and get educational content too. Um, so you're not just reaching people who are in different divisions, so like utility and commercial and landscape, water management, all of that, but also delivering content in a manner that speaks to them. So you can't just give them a pamphlet and say, here, have a tailgate and you're good. Yeah. But figuring out how to deliver it in a way that is meaningful. So I work with all of our service lines to try and figure out how to solve that universal pro that all of the companies have. Like, how do you get information that resonates with arborists so they can do safe and um, high quality work. Yeah, so you want to make sure that they're actually understanding the things that they're learning. Yeah. Okay, cool, yeah. yeah. So, um, what brought you here? To Expo or to Tree Care? To, yeah, let's find out how you started in Tree Care <laughs> in general. I want to hear that. Uh, so I came to Tree Care quite by accident. I started in rock climbing and as an architecture student, mm -hmm. which landed me in landscape architecture. Okay. Uh, and I was also teaching rock climbing at the time while I was in college. And long story short, they needed an arborist assistant and they asked me, hey, do you want a campus job being an arborist assistant? Uh, cool. What campus? Yeah, so I didn't know that arboriculture was a thing at that point. I didn't know you could get paid to climb trees. But then meeting the campus arborist, I learned, hey, that's a thing. Yeah. Could I make this my thing? So finished the architecture degree, moved on to arboriculture, and just sort of went from there. Loved what, it. What school was that at? Uh, I finished my master's in arb at UMass Amherst, but the arborist works at Smith College. Okay, cool. And uh, is the program that you did still available? Like, is it still yes. around? Awesome. Yes. So UMass has a two-year degree and four, and then I went through the master's. Okay, cool. And and you've worked as a production arborist as well? Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. What's uh what's your setup? Like what's your climbing setup? Depends on the day, depends on the tree. Okay. Um I love the akimbo. Yeah. That's become my new favorite thing. Yeah. So I'm usually a pretty late adopter for new climbing tech. I feel uh, like. the recalls, the the everything that goes through that vetting process, I fully trust it and I let it work its way through before I get on board. You're not like the first in line at the Apple nope. release and yeah, stuff. Yeah, not me. And I think part of that is because I'm not in production anymore. I'm not climbing as frequently as I once did. Mm -hmm. So when I do climb, I want to make sure that I'm making the most out of that time. Yep. And so I tend to wait a year, see where things are, let them run their course, and then hop on. That's fair. Um, it's a big investment if you don't know what you're getting. Exactly. I've made a lot of dumb purchases early <laughs> in my career that the equipment has sat around and like, why did I buy that? that a few hundred dollars down the drain. Cool. So. I would ask you what, but I don't want to piss anybody <laughs> off. Okay, okay, what do you like about the Akimbo? I like how responsive it is to adjusting the friction okay. on it. Okay. I like the ease of starting to work with it. I think there is a learning curve with, I mean, with anything, there's a learning curve. Mm -hmm. And the ability to get it wrong, I feel like, is pretty. Uh, small with the akimbo. I mean, obviously you could install it upside down or yeah. miss something, but it's Just pretty... Just stay up on it. Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> user-friendly. Mm -hmm. Obviously the midline installation is a big yes. bonus, um, but I've just found it pretty easy to adapt to. Again, I'm not climbing with the frequency as I did at some point, so being able to adapt to it quickly and then just enjoy it instead of spending all this time trying to dial it in. Mm -hmm. I don't I'm sorry, I don't want to spend that time. I just want to enjoy the climb and not be frizzling around with the equipment. Yeah. I just want to play. Yeah, it's less about tinkering and more about actually getting out into the tree. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, yeah. totally. Um, and yeah, like you you were, it actually kind of helps segue into what you and I were talking about beforehand where you were saying like that you want quality equipment and you're a little bit worried about not so quality equipment out there. So like, have you been seeing some like not, like some, um, questionable quality equipment coming through Davy or? Uh, so I do a lot of random workshops uh, with Davy, but mostly outside of Davy. Okay. Um, sometimes it's student competitions that come through, the TCCs, 
various workshops where people are bringing their own equipment in, yeah. and obviously we're going to do a gear inspection before anybody's going to go out and play. Okay. And some of the equipment that I end up seeing when I start to ask them questions, where did you buy this, how did you get it, they're not the original owner of their equipment, they don't know the history of it, they bought it on Amazon, they bought it on eBay. That's the stuff that scares me, yeah. especially when it's like a student competition. They're already on a tight budget. I feel for them. Yeah. If you see that $50 harness, it's tempting. But that is scary. And You've seen somebody on like a $50 harness? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Because I found it then on Amazon because I go back and try and find these things. Yeah. And it's clearly trying to be a pretzel harness. I can't find it anymore. So this was a few years back mm -hmm. that I found it. And it's got copied all the stitching. So it's got that contrast stitching that pretzel has. Okay. And... It's very obvious what they're trying to do, and then when you read the reviews of it, it's like, thank you, Amazon, for trying to kill me, because people have had failures with it. <laughs> so, then you get students who are brand new and trying to get pumped up, and don't know any better to go to our reputable retailers. They're just doing what they know, yeah. and they end up with something that could potentially kill them. Yeah. And then on top of that, I'm seeing uh, equipment that is clearly Again, trying to be something that looks like our equipment, mm -hmm. like ropes that you truly cannot, like you can be a major rope nerd and still not be able to tell that this is not really? a rated rope. Because I think we normally compare, like, don't get it from Home Depot. Well, yeah, usually if you look at those Home Depot ropes, you can tell mm -hmm. this is not the same construction as our ropes, but some of these are pretty spot on. Ascenders, harnesses, um, lanyards I've seen, uh, even gaffs. Really? That it's like, okay, well, gaffs, is it life support? Well, if they fail on you, it could be a bad day. Yeah, you don't want to gaff out. No. And, like, um, some people are climbing with just gaffs and a lanyard, and, you know, that's yep. not, it's not ideal, but there are those people out there, and if they're climbing on Amazon gaffs. Yeah. Yeah. So, to me, it's, it's a bit of a soapbox of mine for people who are... I mean, first of all, you've got the people who are just entering the industry, don't know any better. Let's let them know that it's important to shop at these places that are getting equipment that is rated for the work that we do. Yeah. But also for the experienced people to raise awareness of you're inspecting gear and there's a very good chance that the person sitting in front of you doesn't know the history of their gear and has purchased it from somewhere that they've managed to, in, I don't mean intentionally, like in accidentally ended up with a piece of equipment that even if we know gear could potentially get it wrong where we think it's something that it's not okay. unless we're really careful and look for those ratings look for those markings yeah. that it's legit i've heard things about there being like a ce stamp that's like a fake ce stamp have you heard about I've that i've seen i've seen stamps so i'm uh, i'm trying to dig a little bit deeper into markings to um what better way to learn something than to write an article about it? So I'm trying to dig deeper to get a better understanding of all the markings and make sure I know what I'm looking at because yeah. we look for the CE marking, we look for the EN, we look for ANSI, but then are we confirming that what's on there is legit, legit <laughs> or is it some company that's they know they need a CE marking so they throw one on there, yeah. is that a real number? The an actual testing facility? I don't know. So, looking into that and doing our due diligence. Yeah. Um, I saw a cool thing on RFID chips inside yes. of, inside of, like, carabiners and stuff. That could be, that could solve a lot of these problems. I mean, until they figure out how to do those, but, yeah. But, I, yeah. Yeah, I just think it's something we need to be aware of. I don't think it was a huge issue 20 years ago, and the market was so small for what equipment we were purchasing. Yeah. But at this point... I can't imagine anybody knows everything that's out there. Yeah. And so we have to trust the user manuals that come with it. We have to trust the person standing in front of us who tells us that it's good and can tell us where they purchased it, when they purchased it, all of that. There's a lot of trust involved now. Yeah. Um, and that scares me a bit, unless people know that there's something to be aware of. Yeah. You said you're writing an article about it? Working on it. I can't say that it's been high on the priority <laughs> list. But I've, I been, don't blame you. I've been encouraged by my peers to please um, push that one a little bit further along because just the level of awareness for other people to recognize that there is equipment out there yeah. floating about. And when I find them, it's like that unicorn moment of peace. 
exists. It's yeah. real. And I've only had a few times that I've actually come across them. Yeah. It's one of those things. Again, it's a unicorn yeah. thing. I know it's there, but when will, you, when will it pop up next? Yeah. And will that be in the ISA magazine? Like, where can we look for that? I'm going to try and get the word out there wherever I can. I say CCIA, I think it's really important for people to be okay. aware of the value of why we need to be yeah. going to retail retailers and as well as why retailers need to be doing their due diligence and yeah. do us the favor of making sure to only sell equipment that we should be using. Yeah, that's fair. I did see, I forget what kind of rope it was, but I saw, you know how Walmart operates as kind of like a second Amazon where they like bring in stuff mm -hmm. from other companies? I saw them selling rope. Really? It was like climbing rope. And I'm, I'm wondering now in <laughs> retrospect, like, was that at all reputable? Because I think they do like third party sellers through the Walmart website. Oh man. Yeah. Okay. Well, so for anybody looking to save a buck, don't do it that way because it's your life. It is. Um, and then is this like you said you were you were involved in rock climbing before, and I imagine you still are. Um, I try to. There's not a lot of climbing in Central Illinois, <laughs> which is where I live. Champagne, uh, right? Yep, yeah. Yeah. Champagne. But I do still love rock climbing. I just went the other day, and it was a ton of fun. Is so. this a is this equipment issue? An issue in rock climbing, as far as you know, or? As far as I know, no. I don't. But um, honestly, since I've switched over to trees, I haven't gotten as much into the gear with rock climbing as I have with trees. Mm. So and with, with rock climbing, you're much more about the rock. Yeah. And with us, we're much more about the rope. We're rope climbers. Yeah. And for rock, it's just a backup. Yeah. So, if you're sitting in your harness while you're rock climbing, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you're doing trad climbing, if you're getting like super into, you're going to go climb El Cap. Yeah, they're going to be gearheads. Um, I didn't get that into it. I like being able to walk and know I'm going to be alive at the end of the day. So I didn't get that. So you it. became an arborist. So I became an arborist. <laughs> yes, that totally made sense. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. Um, okay. And uh, just before we move on to any other topic with that, like if somebody's coming in and they're, they're poor, they're like starting out as an arborist and they have nothing and they're getting paid low arborist wages. Um, how can they find equipment that's affordable? Or like, what can they do to sort of build up their kit in a, in a sustainable manner? It's a great question, because as an employer, your employer should be providing you with the PPE that you need to protect yourself from the hazards in the workplace, mm -hmm. right? So we usually consider that your helmet, your eye protection, your hearing protection, um, boots, it seems to vary from company to company if they're going to provide you an allowance for boots or buy them, but the hazard is also fall protection, right? Yeah. And I know it varies by the employer, but if your employer is doing their due diligence and protecting you, they should be providing you with the protection that you need and not putting the onus on the employee to figure it out. Yeah. Now, if you're not, if you're trying to go about it on your own, probably um, shouldn't. <laughs> probably shouldn't. Find a mentor. <laughs> Find somebody who can get you in that direction. Like, if you're starting brand spanking new, don't just pick out of a catalog and like point at, oh, there's the cheapest. Even if you know it's reputable, don't pick the cheapest thing yeah. because if, if it doesn't fit your body, you're gonna hate yourself for it, mm -hmm. as you know. Yes. It's gonna be miserable. <laughs> like, you want that harness that's gonna feel like butter on your hips. You want the rope that's gonna fit your hands mm -hmm. and is ergonomically friendly and is gonna work for the system that you're gonna have to set up. Yeah. Um, it's not just about getting started with the basic stuff. Yeah. Um, not cool. telling you anything you don't know. <laughs> no. What uh, what harness are you on? I'm on a Tree Motion Light. Okay. And you find it fits nice? It does fit very pretty well. I wish I'd gone with like the full Tree Motion yeah. because um, I like the buckle and I missed the memo when I was looking uh, to get out of it quickly. Yeah. So I just need to loosen that up. But it's a great harness. I love the fit. Um, I love the option of the the two D's, the upper and the lower D makes it yeah. super nice and flexible for what I want to do. Awesome. So I'm in love with it. My first harness was the, uh, oh, what do I have, Butterfly, um, the that Comet from? Miller. Oh, okay. And I thought that's what all harnesses needed to be. And it doubled as, like, it went way up. Yeah, so high. it was like a like yeah, an underwear it was a bra. Push up. Yeah. <laughs> and I had no idea that that's not how it was supposed to fit until someone said, Is that how it always is? Is that not how it is for everybody else? So unless you're told, it's pretty hard to know. Yeah. We have pretty low standards until someone tells us that they can be higher. 
Yeah, I yeah. started off on uh, on a. I won't say the name because you know you never know who you're gonna piss off. But I started off on a harness, the same thing where it was like it, it was not meant for my frame. Whatsoever. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing too, and not to comment Miller because for somebody that harness is perfect. Exactly. It wasn't for my body. Yeah. Yeah. No. They, um, a lot of stuff that was made before our time was not made with us <laughs> in in mind. Um, and sort of on that note, um, you were at the you've been at two women's events in the past little while. Um, yes. You're at the Women's Tree Climbing Workshop in, where was it? In Camp High Rock in the Berkshires in Massachusetts. Okay, and you were at the uh, women's event that was here yesterday as well. Yes. Um, did you gather anything from that that was amazing? Like, you've been to a lot of these things, obviously. Like, you're not new to women's events, but, like, was there anything that you got out of these that you, that you see as different or that stood out to you or anything like that? I'm seeing a lot more, at the women's forums, I'm seeing a lot more men coming in and taking a back seat and listening, which is nice, because I'd say a number of years back, we'd get the occasional man who'd show up and he'd either take the opportunity for a platform or they'd not feel welcome, which is also a problem, Mm -hmm. because we need to all be in the conversation. And I saw yesterday a lot of people just sitting back and listening and taking it in, because it's not all easy stuff to hear. Yeah. And for us to make progress, we have to have those hard conversations that can be very uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, but seeing that, is, I think, is great progress yeah. for us. Yeah, I've seen a lot of uh, women doing the industry um, in the time that I've been in it, and it's been really exciting. And yeah, I noticed that too. We, I've been to, like you said, women's events where and then do a lot of the talking and you're like eh, you really should be listening more so I feel what you're saying and um, I think the conversation on the women's side is a lot more productive it's less um, about bathrooms <laughs> it's less about bathrooms it's less man hating it's much more productive conversation of how how can I do better how can I communicate better in my office what can I do to advocate for myself for other people it's I think a much more productive conversation than like shaking and ah. yeah um if uh for somebody who's never been to one of these things like uh what are the types of conversations that you hear happening at this like what would you want somebody who's never been to it to know about it the main takeaway is building your network mm-hmm. networking is a huge part of all of this as someone who's introverted that's pretty hard but it is absolutely essential not not just for finding a job, but to be able to have those conversations of how does that harness fit for you? Mm -hmm. And what about this? Where did you get that? Um, How did you make it through this? How did you negotiate wages? Like all of the things that women aren't really encouraged to learn how to do, being able to have those conversations um, is a huge benefit to showing up to those sorts of events. There are also uh, the men were there too who are asking the questions and it's that opportunity. It's, I don't think a lot of women get asked questions in the field. Mm-hmm. So here's an opportunity is someone's asking you. So yeah. tell them, this is what I need to be effective at my job. And that's all we want. We just want to do a good job. Yeah. We uh, don't want to sit and talk about women's issues all day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely Truly, not. Like that's not the want. No, it's, it's so annoying. Like I have been to women's events where it turns into like just complaining about like crappy guys we've worked with and it's like it's not really why we're why we're having these things and yeah like you're saying it's it's not about it's not about man hating we're not we're getting together not to talk about men that's like we do that enough <laughs> we don't need we don't need another event just to talk about men yeah um, and the reality is none of us want to talk about bathroom issues none of us want to talk no. about um whatever it is we want to talk about gear, we want to talk about rigging, we want to talk about trees, we want to talk about the work at hand, why we got into art. We didn't get into it so we could sit and stare at other women in a women's forum because we're struggling to just do the same darn work that everybody else is doing. Yeah. So I feel like if we remember that, that I should speak for myself, I don't want to be there. We don't want to be there. We want to just be in the rest of the expo with everybody else. Exactly. But we've got to make progress to get there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I was at the um, 
the women's talk that was just happening and that room was overflowing. We're gonna, yeah, we're gonna need a new room next year. We're gonna need something bigger. So that was really exciting. It's a good problem to have. Yep, it's a um, great problem to have. Yeah, and like you're saying, same thing with men participating in a, in a really respectful manner. That was so refreshing. It was so mm -hmm. good. Um, I remember once, just to, you know, overtake my own interview. Um, yeah. I remember once um, a colleague of mine I mentioned something about, you know, menstruating, and he asked me what it was like. And honestly, to be asked what I was experiencing in that moment so that he could accommodate me, and not, like, to have it assumed, like, oh, she's going through that lady time, like, I have to do this and that. It was like, no, 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 what do you need? I was like, you're asking me what I need right now? And it doesn't have to be that. It's like anything. Like, if if a guy asks you what, that you're working with, if, if anybody asks you, male or female, asks you, like, hey, what do you need right now? It's the most refreshing, refreshing question to hear. Yeah, it's, and it's really beneficial. And it should transcend to their male colleagues as well. Mm -hmm. We should all just be asking each other, "What can I do for you?" Yeah, yeah. I definitely think that mental health isn't addressed enough in this industry, and uh, it's it's getting a bit better. But yeah. I'd like to see I'd like to see more of that. And I guess that's a good place to start asking each other what we can do for each other. Yeah, mm -hmm. a lot of the conversation I think yesterday was about respect, about communication. And that's not a women's topic. Yeah, it's definitely not. Universal topic. Okay. Um, and where do you see yourself like going next? Like, do you have any? Do you have any plans for moving forward in your career, or like anything you want to bring to Davy or elsewhere? I am super happy in my role. I'm three years in, which it, or almost three years in, which in the world of Davy is still a baby. Okay. And I am really looking forward to the opportunity of building more educational content, getting, the ARB is just, we're not in written history nearly enough, which I need to recognize that written word is not our strength as an industry, but we need it to be able to then build other things, I think. I think we need to have far more documentation. There's so much collective knowledge in this industry that we all hold, but unless we put it together, it's just in our heads, okay. and so my kind of long-term goal is trying to get our, what is it, crowdsource, crowdsource our knowledge to document everything that we know about tree care, mostly gear, <laughs> that's where I like, yeah. trying to get that knowledge put together, and from a Davy standpoint, getting the content out there, getting employees because it's such a big company it will extend past the company yeah is getting them the education that they need getting into the right people's hands and also helping to build that diverse workforce so um, helping to support women and people of color to get out there and feel safe to do their jobs yeah so that way they can focus on the women here have you seen an increase in people of color like joining the industry um in the past few years at all? I don't know that I have. Okay. There could be. Is there anything um, that we can do to I make think, it easier? I think part of it is just talking about it and getting it out there. Um, and I think it's also super regionally specific. So my not seeing it could be also because I'm in central Illinois. Um, I'm not sure there's people of color somewhere there. <laughs> oh yeah, well I should say there's not a lot of tree work in oh, my area. Because okay. um, it's it's a lot of corn, um, so there's not a lot of tree work happening there, but the Chicago area is pretty diverse, which is awesome, um, but it varies depending on where in the country you are, and then obviously globally it's going to be different, so I can't speak to how it's changing internationally. Sorry. Yeah. Maybe going to pull it closer so that hopefully we can hear better. That angle sucks, but okay. I know, we're all like, <laughs> yeah. my chin's I hope you like now. triple chin. Yes. Um, I'm hoping that I should have brought a microphone up, but you know. Um, if it works, it works. If you have to scrap it. Yeah. Um, I I know that I've seen an increase in Toronto because we the there was a government implemented like it was a private public partnership um, that was implemented that was a grounds worker training program, and so what they did was they got a whole bunch of government funding to train. Uh, particularly women, people of color, and gender minorities on um, 
like how to do basic groundwork. So running a chainsaw, running a chipper, um, running ropes for the climber, stuff like that. Because I know that when I started out, um, I couldn't get a job. I, I called 30 plus companies. I made an Excel spreadsheet and I one by one called them with my spiel. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, like, hey, I've never done this, but I promise you I, I work out and stuff. Like I, I can handle it. Um, and I got denied over and over and over on the basis of having no experience. And yeah. it's like, I've seen these guys hire meth heads off the street. What do you mean I have no experience? But um, ever since they've implemented this program, that's no longer been something that employers can say anymore because all of these people are now trained on how to be a groundie. So there is no you have no experience. And yeah, ever since that program was implemented, I've noticed a, a huge increase in the amount of representation of non-white men in yeah. in our in our local industry so yeah. yeah i'd like to see something like that expand um well it's gonna be twofold we've got to recruit the people get them in the door but also make sure that where we're putting them that they feel safe That's and that good. their fellow crew members are going to accept them and treat them with respect once they're in that door yeah yeah you're right it's one thing to get somebody at a job but if it's going to be a miserable place for them they're not going to want to stay yeah um and then, do you, okay, this is just sort of like a broad question and take as much time, we can edit out whatever time you take to think about it, but um, do you have like any really good tree climbing or arborist or work memories that like really stand out to you? Oh gosh, tons. <laughs> and just overall, it's just, I can't say any one experience, it's just being in a tree and being able to just hang out. Um, and I feel like most of the time when I've had a good time, it's usually training because okay. I love working particularly with people who have self-doubt of, is this my space? Is this where I'm supposed to be? Yeah. Um, so being able to work with people who are in that mindset and helping them to get through their own mental barriers of, do I belong in this? Yeah. That to me is exactly what I want every time. Um, that makes me so happy. <laughs> yeah. From a, from a regular climbing standpoint, we've had some, just some general fun climbs. I think just experiences working with other people who have served as mentors and just playing around with, hey, let's play with this piece of gear. Like, again, it's not any one experience. It's just Playing with equipment, mm -hmm. playing with trees. In a non-work pressure environment. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, being able to enjoy the experience instead of rush it. And I've had the good fortune in my career to generally avoid being in that high pressure. Because I'm not great at that. I really <laughs> just enjoy being in that environment of if we want to do good tree work and yeah. focus on the trees. And um, so yeah, that's where I'm really happy. That's where I like the training side of things. <laughs> I really like hearing that because like I, I see, I get the vibe that like a lot of people, maybe it's just like online toxicity or whatever, but I get the vibe that there's a lot of people who think that like the only way to do this is to be like a, like a go, 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 smash it out, big jobs, like all day, like slaying dragons, mm -hmm. um, tree service. And it's nice to hear that like, you know, there are other ways of doing this. Like it does not have to be that. Like, yeah, honestly, power to, power to those guys and girls that are doing that type of stuff. Like, but I, I want to preserve my career. <laughs> yeah, no, it's legit. I mean, I think you've got different kinds of arborists. You've got the adrenaline junkies, the people who love it. They're going to take that massive swing not because they have to but because they want to and it's awesome and they have fun and that's what pulls them into the industry and that's great and then you've got the other group of people who just love being one with the trees and hang and chill <laughs> like i want to set up a tree boat in there and hang yeah like that's more my speed um so yeah i think you and we need to have both right yeah. to kind of um, succeed as an industry because with different mindsets you get different creativity and you get innovation from different groups that's how we're pushing pushing the envelope and evolving and the evolution of this industry just like in our careers has been 
it's been good. Yeah. <laughs> it's been the best thing I've ever done. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's a, I think, a pretty cool time to be in all of this to see the mix of generations here. It's been awesome. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that's enough. I'm going to wrap it up and I'm going to do some uh, awkward formal handshake with yeah. you on camera. Oh, yes. Thank you very yeah, much, ma'am. It's been lovely. Been <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Thanks for, thanks for this and hopefully it will turn out all right. Yeah. Yay. Thanks, Clogger.